Shout with joy to God on the earth. Sing to the glory of his name. Offer him glory and praise. Sing to the glory of his name. 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 Hello everybody, welcome back to the Devoratorium. My name is Darnay Devore and I'm going to be your host. On today's episode, my 12 major issues with the Hebrew Israelite movement. Now I've been studying, listening to, and observing the Hebrew Israelites for years now. And as I do, 12 familiar issues, they just continue to rise to the top. I acknowledge that there are different Hebrew Israelite camps and their doctrines can vary from camp to camp. So some of the issues that I mentioned will not apply to every camp. So I'm only going to be discussing the Hebrew Israelite teachings as I've discovered them or encountered them myself. Now there's so much more than just 12, but these are just the 12 that I'm going to present in this four part video series. There's going to be three issues that I have in each of the four part video series. Now, some of these issues I've already made an entire video about. So check my playlist, make sure you check the playlist or the links that I'm going to leave at the bottom of the videos, but other issues you'll be hearing about for the very first time. So if you're a curious Hebrew Israelite and you're wanting to know about the objections that some folks may have to the Hebrew Israelite movement, or if you're on the fence about uh, this movement and you're looking just for more perspective before making a decision, or if you're a Christian, okay, and you're just curious about what may be so attractive about this movement, let's dive in together so we can find and we can find out some answers through scripture. Issue number one for me is that the Hebrew Israelite movement is Afrocentric. Now, whenever you see the Hebrew Israelites out and about, a lot of them tend to wear these elaborate uniforms. Uh, they talk loud, they talk proud, and whether they're marching on the street or doing some kind of street preaching, it's a show. It's a show. Look at us, we're the ones. Now you'll see a hint of people like this that resemble this in Matthew chapter 23, verse five through seven. Check it out. Now, my question, would Hebrew Israelites be as assertive and committed to God if God actually did not look like them? That's a big question. It never fails though. Most cultures or people groups, they tend to fashion God in their own image rather than accept that we were all made in his image in Genesis 1 verse 27. No matter what color you are, no matter what nation you're from, all mankind were made in the image of God, the one true God. So why is it that this one particular movement, they believe that the one omnipotent, all-knowing, infinite God and creator of all things near and far, visible and invisible, they believe that that God looks like an African-American man in America. They believe that God looks just like them due to a misinterpretation of scriptures like Daniel chapter 7 verse 9 and Revelation chapter 1 verse 14 through 15. But if God didn't look like them, if it can be proven that God did not look like them, would they still bow to God. Hebrew Israelites expect everyone to bow to a God who is black, but could they do the same if he was not black? Let's just put this to rest. No one can actually look like God because God is a spirit, according to John 4 and verse 24. And he has no physical body. He did not become flesh. God the Father did not become flesh. God the Son became flesh in John chapter 1 verse 14. Every time you read about um, the hand of God or God sitting on a throne, these are just analogies so we can understand what's going on. But remember, just keep this in mind. Although God was in a covenant relationship with the nation of Israel, that's why he's called the God of Israel or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Although he was in a covenant relationship with Israel, he was also the God of all mankind. He created everyone everywhere and everyone everywhere will be accountable to him. We see that in Acts chapter 17, verse 24 through 25. Let's read that together. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. 
and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. We're going to pause for just a moment. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the Greeks in their capital city of Athens. And they've got a, a whole city full of idols. And what they would do is they would build temples for their uh, fake gods. Okay, they build temples for them and they would serve those false gods. And Paul is cutting them right to the quick. He's telling them that the God who made the world and everything, including them, doesn't live in these temples. They don't, he doesn't live in these temples and he can't be served by their hands as they, as the Greeks were so proud and prone to do. He doesn't need anything, but Paul says, rather we need him. We need God. Why? Because he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Uh, Paul is telling these Greeks that don't know the one true God, that the one true God gives them life and breath and everything else as well. Okay. So understand God, the father, the God was the God of all mankind. It says so right here. If you only worship a God whom you believe looks like you, you're essentially just worshiping yourself. Do you know what I said when I used to think that Jesus was white? Yeah. I mean, the white Blue eyed, blonde hair, just looked like he stepped out of a, a hair commercial or something. Okay, the good looking white Jesus. Do you know what I thought or what I said when I thought he was white? Here's what I said I said, cool, God became flesh, according to John 1 14, sacrificed himself for my sin, according to Hebrews 10 10, so I can live eternally in heaven, John 3 16. That's what I said. Now, here's the counter. Do you know what I said when I started realizing that Jesus is not white, that he's probably either black or some kind of uh, colored olive skinned or he's something other than white? OK, do you know what I said then? What I said was cool. God became flesh, according to John 1, 14, sacrifice himself for my sin, according to Hebrews 10, 10 so I can live eternally in heaven, John 3, 16. The color of Jesus' skin does not change his identity. The color of Jesus' skin never changes his divinity. It doesn't change his character or the power of his sacrifice to all mankind. Christianity is based on the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's a Christ-centric viewpoint. Hebrew Israelism, as I've discovered, is based on the specific color of Jesus and that color being black makes Hebrew Israelism Afrocentric. Now, if you want to topple Christianity, all you have to do is prove that Jesus never existed or when Jesus died, he was never uh, resurrected and then all Christianity topples down. So that's a heavy, heavy load to try to figure out because there are extra biblical resources that point to the existence of Jesus and his resurrection. However, if you want to take down Hebrew Israelism, all you have to do is prove that Jesus wasn't black. Something so very superficial can topple that entire faith movement. So if there are folks out there that are so focused on what color Jesus was, don't stop there. Figure out how tall he was, because maybe if he was tall, he's only going to come back and save tall people or figure out if he was in decent shape or maybe a little bit heavy, because whichever side he falls on, those are the identity of the people that he's coming to save. Right. Right. No, that's not what the apostles taught. That's not what the Bible says. And that's not why Jesus died. I mentioned this before. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall look like him shall not perish. Wait a minute. That's not what it says, does it? It's not about whether you look like him or not. Whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Focus on the identity of the Messiah. God made flesh, sinless life, the miracles he performed, the wisdom, okay, that, that he gave us, his perfection, Focus on that stuff because that's where salvation actually is. Issue number two, 
former Christians with a question mark. Many Hebrew Israelites have a claim to have been former Christians. Now, they're telling you that if you're a Christian, they understand. They've been where you are, and now they're free, and you can be free too. So here's a challenge for them. Ask them about it. Ask them what church they attended, who was the minister, and, and what was so sinful or anti-Bible about what they were being taught while they were at that church. And then ask them if you were to contact that former church of theirs, would they even know their name? When I listen to their assertions, okay, of what Christians teach, based on their time as a Christian, from what they tell me, it's almost as if they never actually went to church or they only maybe went out of coercion from their immediate family. They completely, completely misrepresent Christian theology as if they've never really heard the message of Christianity. They were probably pew warmers, and I know because I used to be one, people that just go to church and warm up the pews, but they were probably pew warmers at best, but never had a true conversion to the one true Christ Jesus. They're so quick to point out uh, the errors of celebrating things like Easter uh, or, or Christmas within the church, but they fail to realize that churches are autonomous and not all churches celebrate those festivities. If you walk into one church and they've got Easter paraphernalia all over the place, you can just as easily walk out and find another church that doesn't do that. Yeah, there are churches that celebrate Easter. There are churches that celebrate um, Resurrection Sunday. Okay. And there are some uh, churches that don't celebrate anything. They just go on every, every Sunday, worshiping the one true God in, in spirit and in truth. And they don't observe anything like that. You can take your pick. Whether churches celebrate uh, Easter or Christmas is more or less an individual option for a church rather than a Christian teaching for all churches everywhere. See, churches have freedom in Christ. This is how this works. Churches have freedom in Christ, Colossians 2, 16 through 23. Churches are not commanded to follow the works of the Mosaic law because those works of the Mosaic law, they are a curse according to Galatians 3, 10, and Christ freed us from the curse of the law in Galatians 3, 13. As a Christian, though, once, once you've accepted Christ, there is no counter offer that can compare. Jesus gives eternal life, John 10, 28, period. It's all about Jesus, a Christ-centric worship, a Christ-centric focus. The only counter offer, no matter how good it sounds, is eternal death, according to Revelation 21 and 8. So if, if these former Christians that are now Hebrew Israelites, if they were truly Christians who accepted Jesus in the Christian church, why did they leave? What was so attractive outside of salvation through Christ alone was so appealing to them? First John 2 verse 19 touches on this a little bit. It reads, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So why did they go? What pulled them away? They tended to leave, I found, in just looking at a lot of the uh, Hebrew Israelite testimony through the years, they tended to leave because the Hebrew Israelite message was more seductive. How is it more seductive? That brings us to issue number three. Issue number three is, it's all about you. This is what's so appealing. It's all about you. Some of these Hebrew Israelites who were former Christians, their main issue with Christian doctrine is that it doesn't focus on themselves as the nation of Israel. Some Hebrew Israelites are taught that the true nation of Israel is either African American exclusively, no one else, or it's African American and Latino and Native American and a few others. Okay, you'll find that they have a 12 tribes chart that they go by that tells you who are all the Israelites. They believe that they are the center point of the scriptures, though. Okay, so when they look through the scriptures, they're looking for themselves. When the church teaches about Jesus and the salvation he offers to every creature under heaven, according to Colossians 1.23, Hebrew Israelites view this as a lie, as, as it's not exclusive to just them. 
is not exclusive, exclusive to the nation of Israel. So they teach that Jesus was a black man and will only save people who look like himself and obey the commandments. Therefore, the Hebrew Israelite doctrine involves discovering who the exact tribes are to learn who's going to be saved and thus inherit the earth. This prompts a focus on you, just you, your bloodline, your heritage, and thus your eventual inheritance. If Christian doctrine does not focus on uplifting and favoring the nation of Israel, then it's a lie according to the Hebrew Israelite. Once again, let's peek into what the Bible says the scriptures are all about. This is Jesus himself in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Whoa. So that's the whole Bible. That's the entire Old Testament rather. And we know what the New Testament focuses on. So this is what the Christian church focuses on or should. I'm not going to go out there and say every single Christian church is a biblical church. There are some Christian churches that are no longer Christian. They're Christian in name only. Okay. But I'm going to say this is what the Christian church should be focused on. The Old Testament points to the coming of Christ and the New Testament is his arrival. Now, if the scriptures were about Israel, all about Israel and nothing but Israel, we'd still be condemned to die for our sin and probably still dancing around a golden calf at Mount Sinai from Exodus chapter 32. If you read the Old Testament or the New and you only see a reflection of yourself, you're only studying the Bible as a mirror rather than a big bright sign pointing to Jesus, the one and true Messiah. Now, this is nothing new, nothing new as Anglo-Israelism and the Christian identity movement does the same thing, except these guys are white. These movements believe that white folks are the true blood descendants of Israel. And they prove this with the blessings from Deuteronomy 28 rather than the curses and they have their own 12 tribes chart. Do you get this? They believe that they are so blessed and have been blessed with money, opportunity, and, and power and means that they consider themselves uh, under the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 because they never broke the commandments. The black Hebrew Israelites say, no, it's about us because look at these curses. They're looking at the same book, same chapter, but different ends to try to prove who they are. All this is selfism. It's all about selfism in the Bible, and it stretches all the way back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 through 5, what does Satan say to tempt Adam and Eve to break God's commandment and eat the forbidden fruit? What does Satan say? Satan says, you will be like God. Satan knew there was nothing he could offer Adam and Eve that they did not already have. They had dominion over the whole world. Everything bowed to their will because they were under God's dominion. Okay, so what could Satan offer them except, hey, I can't give you anything you don't already have, but I can make you like God. We know Satan was lying the whole time, but Satan tempted them at their pride point. He went into their very identity. He said, you can be like God. And I see the same thing happening today. People... A lot of these movements are touching on those personal pride points of the human heart. What happens when you study the Bible in search of you? You find pride, which turns to prejudice. Think about it. Everyone whom you ever want to label to be prejudiced, it started with their own pride in themselves. What happens when you study the Bible in search of Jesus? You find humility, forgiveness, and you become saved. So I don't want anyone to think that I've got a problem with Jesus being black. He can very well be black. And if he is, then he is. If he's not black, okay, if he's uh, uh, caramel colored or non-black in any way, that's fine too. My problem is the therefore, that Jesus is black, therefore, he will only save others who are black. Or Jesus is white, therefore. He favors white folks and will only save white folks. Or Abraham was black, therefore, everyone from his lineage is black. Every time we hit that therefore, that's where I'm going to have a problem with the conclusion. 
the therefore. So I want you to check out the additional links that I put at the bottom of this video. This is the end of video number one, issue number one through issue number three. Stay tuned for video number two, which we'll be looking at issue number four through issue number six. I want to thank everybody for joining me today. Stay tuned for the next video.